Welcome to Our Town, a 30-minute podcast brought to you by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. It is uh, 943, News Talk 630 WMAO. We're we getting will word continue now. to update you on the World Trade Center bombing the planes, the two planes that have crashed in. But now we have unconfirmed reports there has been an explosion. There is a fire at the Pentagon here in Washington. And uh, Andy Ockershausen is on uh, the line with us right now. Andy, Andy what do you have? No, I'm right uh, about, uh, oh, maybe uh, 200 yards from the Pentagon. And definitely something hit that building. I was on Army-Navy Drive when an airplane came over very low. I did not see it, but I heard it. And right. I'm looking at it right now, and I can tell you that black smoke is billowing, and uh, there's fire equipment. Uh, people are running out of the Marine Corps headquarters, all the other buildings. It hit on the side where they're doing the repairs on the Pentagon. If you know, they're shutting down and in sections, and it appears to hit the section where the repairs are being made. This is uh, Andy Ockershausen, and this is our town. And I'm speaking with a man who lived through a the day that shall live in infamy, the news director of WML Radio, who was on duty when we had the tragedy of the uh, Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And it's John Matthews, news director of WML Radio, who's been here for 34 years today. Yep. John, what a great career you've had. And that piece that we just heard, John, is a part of our life now. It, it truly is. And I've got to tell you, uh, just by way of, of history, uh, how important the, the fact that you happened to be at the Army-Navy Country Club on that day. You were across the street from the Pentagon. And honestly, and I've said this to you before over the years, you very well may have been the first reporter on hand because... The uh, of course, there were all kinds of press in the Pentagon press offices, but those were on the other side of the Pentagon. I mean, they had to tra- they had to traipse all the way around the building just to get a, a bird's eye view of what was going on. And you were right there. We were so fortunate at WMAL that you that you uh, called us. And who else were you going to call? You were <laughs> it's my home. It was John. your home. It's your home station. I was born. <laughs> we were we were so fortunate that you were able to call and really. I think, and you don't want to gloat about something like this on uh, such a tragic event, but it's just the fact. I think we had the first view of what was going on of anybody in America because you happened to call in. And the, the as you heard, and this is what is, is so memorable, you told us so much in your first minute on the air with us that the rest of the world didn't know about for hours and hours and days. You told us that the the damage may have been or the fatalities may have been minimized because that was the portion of the building that was under construction i would drive by there and see and watch what they were doing they were only doing the five sides they were doing one side yep and and in fact only 125 people in the building were killed uh 62 people on board the plane but only 125 people in the building were killed because for the most part that building had not been occupied yet and had been secured you also told us that the damage may have been minimized because they were working on uh reinforcing the building right and in fact that is windows that is in fact exactly what happened the damage would have been worse if they had not already done a whole lot of reinforcement work you told us you thought it was an american airlines jet the national media didn't have that for hours, and we had it in minutes. So it was just an incredible circumstance, and it was incredibly to the benefit of WMAL and to WMAL's listeners that we were able to get this information out almost immediately. John, the amazing thing about that day to me, was, in spite of living through it, is that so many people told me days, months, and years after they heard that broadcast. Yeah. Now, that might be one of those things, but it also impressed upon me how aware our audience was and how they depended on us for news like that. Yeah. And it was just incredible, John, to, you know, who was that? Andy Parks and Tim Brandt were doing the morning show. Yeah. And they wanted it right away. Yep. And they knew the territory. Well, the, they knew what we were dealing with. The interesting thing was it was for the most part, and even to this day, was a New York story. What the tragedy that happened in New York was the one that got the headlines, but it was a very real story for us. And um, even as people couldn't peel their eyes away from the television and see what happened to the Twin Towers, what happened at the Pentagon was really, it was really a frightening occasion. And it was a fright, it was frightening for us. I remember sitting here in Upper Northwest DC, looking out over the Lord and Taylor and thinking, oh my God, could the next plane be 
coming this way. Nobody knew. Which, in the larger scheme of things, is ridiculous. I don't think uh, the terrorists were going to be targeting Chevy Chase, but it was it, it, the the visceral feeling was certainly there in that moment. Like, if these places are getting hit, you know, who's, who what could, could be, next? be next? What could be next? Well, I, in the course of the conversation with the station, I was in an automobile and I had to move because someone came through in the crowd or in, in the uh, traffic with a loudspeaker and they were announcing, clear the area, there's incoming aircraft. So people began from all the buildings in and around the Pentagon and pouring out of them. I mentioned the Marine Corps headquarters, which is across the road. Right. They were pouring out on all sides. And I got back in the car and said, I better get out of here. So I, th- I did something. I wanted to get out of the area and I crossed the bridge. And the amazing thing was there was no traffic. Yeah. It's just me. I'm running across the 14th Street Bridge into the city. And I said, what happened? Well, what happened? Everybody just stopped where they were. Right. Once I got in the city, it was gridlock. Yeah. I would tell you it took me forever to figure a way to get out of it because cars were stopped. I was on the sidewalk. I went through alleys. Luckily, growing up, I knew the city. and knew where to go to free my way out of it. I wanted to go to WMAL. I wanted to go to find Janice, who was working that day. She couldn't contact me because my phone was dead. I couldn't make a call. Yeah. But I was asked by Tim and Andy to check the Capitol. What, what is there anything going on to Capitol building? And I said, I can't move. Pennsylvania, I said, I can see the Capitol building in the dome, and I can tell you there's no fire, and there's no, they didn't put that on the air, but uh, there's no reason to panic. Nothing is happening in downtown Washington. In fact, nobody can move. We're dead still. But luckily, I got around by the old Evening Star building, through an alley there behind the Warner Theater, and had to go up 14th Street. Why I went up 14th Street, I can tell you, because it goes a long way. I went right. all the way to the end of it because I couldn't get off it, and then found my way across to WMAL, yeah. and I showed up here. Well, it was, uh, it, 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 nobody could get anywhere. I remember both Tim Brandt and Andy Parks who were hosting that morning, when Chris Core came in to relieve them, both of them tried to head into town. Andy Parks only got six or eight blocks down Wisconsin Wisconsin. Avenue, I think, and he had to turn around and come back because he said there was just no no moving. Tim Brandt went down Reno Road and got down by the uh, Naval Observatory, and uh, there were were, uh, uniformed uh, military with machine guns standing outside the vice president's uh, uh, office or his residence, his yeah. residence, and uh, he Tim couldn't get any further. I just want to thank Tim Brandt for heading down there. Are you going off somewhere else now, Tim, to take a look? Well, I was coming down here to take a look. I don't know if you can hear in the distance. The sirens are everywhere, yep. Chris. I'm down by Embassy Road now. There's activity at every embassy down here. Cars have jammed all those little circular driveways in front of all the embassies. They're trying to shut those down. And I just got in the middle of a policeman. I've got to pull over. All right. Yeah, pull over and give me a call back. Things were so crazy. You mentioned your cell phone didn't work. Nobody's cell phone worked that day. <laughs> I remember because, you know, the systems were way overwhelmed. Everybody oh my was, God, you couldn't, you couldn't do a thing. I remember putting the order out on the air. I had reporters, uh, I had one reporter on Metro. I had one reporter heading over to the Pentagon. It took him a couple of hours to get over there. Thank goodness you were there. But I remember giving the order on the air saying, reporters, WMAL reporters, if you can hear the sound of my voice, get to a landline and call in so we know where you are. Now, normally you would never do this, you know, in a regular oh, okay. broadcast day, but all the all the rules flew out the window on, uh, on 9-11. And I was giving out orders to my reporters, basically, because I had no other way of contacting them. And that's just how screwed up communications were that day. Well, we learned a lot. The community learned and the protection people learned and uh, that this city was not ready for an attack. No. No way. And is, it isn't ready for the next one now. That but is that's correct, a, John. That's a whole other hill of beans. The uh, The interesting thing is you, you talked about uh, how many people have told you over the years that they heard uh, heard us on the radio doing our reporting that day. You know, it's interesting, and th- th- this has really occurred to me. It didn't occur to me till after the fact. We spent 40 or 50 years before 9-11, even more, practicing the emergency broadcast system. We would do the original, the alert, this is a, only a oh, test. Yeah. They'd play the tones on the air. Yeah. This was the day that we were practicing to do. 9-11 was the day we were practicing to do the emergency broadcast system. And when the day came, nobody thought to issue a, an emergency alert. There was no 
There were no tones on the emergency broadcast system that day. And the the, the actual reality of the, of the situation is it wasn't needed because everybody knew to turn to us and to the other news stations in town. Our music station, uh, WRQX, put WMAL on oh, their signal. Right. I remember that vividly. And, uh, you know, so people know what to do when when the stuff hits the fan. They they, they know where to turn, and they, they turn to us. Well, John. Nobody even thought of it until after the fact that we hadn't ever fired it off. <laughs> and we didn't know whether to work. John, well, John, one of the reasons is, as you point out, people would know where to turn. But over the years, we developed that reputation, and it goes way back to our guy's interest in the community in our town, Harden and Weaver, was staples of our town. Yep. As everybody else that performed on this station, they cared more than just doing a job. They cared about our town. Sure. And it showed. So when think and that goes to Tom Gager, even Felix Grant. Every cab driver in Washington used to listen to Felix Grant. I was told. I never got in a cab that didn't have Felix on between seven and midnight. You know, every kid would talk about Ken Beatrice and where, how nutty he was. And they, Bill, Bill May, if you couldn't sleep, Bill Mayhew and Larry Krebs provided all night radio. Ne- it was unheard of. Nobody yep. else. Music Till Dawn was the only thing. So, John, it wasn't um, an accident that people turned to WML. No. And, and, of course, you know, that day, our primary anchor throughout most of the day was Chris Core. Absolutely. And Chris, Chris Core, even more so than our other hosts at the time, Chris Core was a was the voice who people knew to turn to. He had been by that point at the radio station for at least a quarter century, even longer actually, and uh, he he basically helped people get home and and to make sense of it in a very local sense. I should have said that Trumbull and Core, they were very part of the community. But Chris was a was a great voice of calm reason. He didn't panic. He stayed in there and did a great job, and that's why he's a very professional guy. We love Chris Gore, yep. and he was so important to WMAL and everything that we did. And the people would turn to him for a lot of reasons. Chris a bright man, as you know, John. Mm-hmm. It was more than just a so-called disc jockey. He was a performer. Sure. Oh. As you were, John. Yeah. We're going to take a break here. This is uh, Andy Ockers out, and this is our town. We're having a great nostalgic day here with John Matthews, news director of the world's greatest radio station, WMAL. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our wonderful restaurants at Washington Harbor. Tony and Joe's, the best seafood in the city. Nick's Riverside Grill, wonderful chops and steaks. Wonderful views of the Kennedy Center, Roosevelt Island, the Roslyn Skyline. Spectacular. Two bars outside, right on the water. Fabulous food. For dinner reservations, call 202-944-4545. It's really a great experience. We'll see you down at Tony and Joe's or Nick's Riverside Grill. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. It's such a terrible thing. and I think the country needs to stick together and help each other. And obviously, as you can see with all these people here, everybody is a man. And there is still human kindness and decency in the area. This is Andy Arkershaus, and this is Our Town, and we're talking with the news director of WMAL, who's been here forever and has knows the story and knows about our great radio station. And he was here the morning of that terrible, terrible day for the Pentagon and for us, and it's John Matthews. Yes, uh, it was a beautiful day. It was... A Tuesday. It was a Tuesday morning. It was, um, for Washington, a almost cool day there was very little breeze in the air there was very little humidity it had to have been in that morning probably 70 degrees it one of those 10 perfect days of the year in washington it, hardly a cloud in the sky it was just gorgeous the uh the, the, the and this all happened the the first uh reports that we got were shortly before nine in the morning i guess and the lead story on the news that day had been that Michael Jordan was going to sign with the Washington Wizards. And you can only imagine how huge of a story that was. Oh, uh, he was, you the know, greatest player of all time. Greatest Coming bas- to our town. Yeah. And just uh, at, at the time they were talking about him joining, I guess, as like the general manager, not as a player. But then he turned out that he was going to play right. too. And it turned out uh, there was a very exciting time. The other lead story, of course, the more national story, was uh, uh, that they were getting closer and closer to uh, 
linking uh, Congressman Gary Condit, actually they, they were trying to, to the death of former intern they Chandra to pin Levy. Him. They were trying to pin him. And it had been in the news for weeks and weeks and weeks. As a matter of fact, the previous uh, Friday, uh, just three or four days before this happened, we had done a we had done a live broadcast. Our nighttime host was a guy named David Lawrence. We did a live broadcast from outside Gary Condit's apartment, <laughs> in I believe it was in Georgetown. It was someplace in the city, and we did the broadcast from from outside Condit's apartment. That's how much everyone was obsessed about it. And then after nine eleven happened, it was months and months and months before you ever heard of anything having That's to do correct. with Chandra Levy or Gary Condit. Just everything else disappeared. He also lost his seat in Congress. Yes. Yes, he absolutely did. And uh, and uh, that, that's that been a whole long story which continues to this day. But uh, that was what was on the minds of Washington. And the first indication that we knew of anything was I was working in the newsroom getting assignments out for to cover Michael Jordan that day. And the first indication we had was that uh, the TV up in the corner I kind of saw out of my eye. I saw the World Trade Center and a trail of smoke coming from it. And we got a special report from ABC News on the air here. And uh, we followed it. It was completely a New York story. The original reports were... And even witnesses said, you know, it was they thought it was a small plane that had gone in there. And the initial thoughts was, well, it was some sort of accident, some small because plane it had pilot. It happened before in the skyscrapers. Yeah, it had happened uh, back in uh, the forties with the, uh, the the World Trade Center, military Center, aircraft, a military aircraft. Well, um, this went on for fifteen or twenty minutes, and then you know, obviously, as uh, I think we had actually done the special report and had come out of the the network coverage and came back in um and as we were on the air i uh, we had peter jennings on the air i believe no we didn't we had the abc news coverage of uh, the abc radio coverage on and they were talking to an eyewitness who had seen you know, the, the smoke coming out and the second plane hit the wingtip had to be at least 150 to 200 feet wide oh my god oh the next building there's another one. Up. Oh my god oh my god another oh, plane the just flew I in feel the, heat. the explosion is incredible the second plane hit and that was live on our air and we knew when the second plane hit because we could see that it was a jumbo jet we knew instantly it was terrorism correct no more light the, aircraft yeah and that was when things that was when things really turned interesting now here at the radio station this is still a new york story to us nothing had happened at the pentagon but we we had to figure out immediately we know it's an act of terrorism we knew that president bush was in florida so we knew that much but we we started to wonder you know usually when we had situations like this we would call local authorities to make sure that they were keeping an eye on things. I, I called the Pentagon and I got a Pentagon spokesman and he it did a quick brief recorded interview with him. And he said, and, and we have the sound and I got a uh, Pentagon spokesman on the phone and he said, we're monitoring the situation. Uh, we no, Nothing as far as we can tell is being threatened here in Washington, but we've got a close eye on it. Not more than 10 minutes after that, the Pentagon had been hit. And not a, more than a couple minutes after that, we heard from you. But it was... Uh it was all it was all coincidental. If I, if I hadn't been, number one, watching television to see the two planes hit, and then we walked outside, and the airplane went over, and, I was, and the man I was speaking with, who happened to be a friend, said, that airplane is not going to the airport, and that's an American Airlines. We could see the tail of it. Right. That's when I hopped in the car and drove down to the... To the site, right? But if if we hadn't have been outside, we'd never known that the airplane was American Airlines, and it was a huge fireball, huge fireball, obscured the whole area of the smoke, mm -hmm. black black smoke. Yes, down. absolutely. Well, you know, it changed. Uh, th that was, and again, you don't want to link tragedy to this, or you don't want to say this in in the wake of tragedy. But again, just speaking the facts, it was the most incredible to this day. It was the most incredible broadcasting day of my life, because. We instantly, we, we kind of threw all format out of the window and we were just throwing stuff on the air it just as quickly as we could. If I was in the newsroom and had new information, uh, I would just run into the news booth, crack open the mic, not wait for anybody to you know give me permission to speak and just speak. We did this for hours and hours and hours. We went four days on this radio station 
without running a single commercial. Wall to for, wall. Wall to wall. As a matter of fact, to the point where we would run the national newscast at the top of the hour, and midway through, two minutes in, there was usually a minute national commercial. We didn't. We covered those with local news. We'd we'd break in and say we'll be back to ABC News in a minute. We'd do yeah. a local of the minute of the local headlines. Get back to the national news and then do our own local news. Well, that was WMAL. Yeah, I mean that was Len Dybert. He believed in it. You believed in it. The reporters believed in it. All our talent believed in it. That we are special and we acted it and that proved it. That money became no object. We wanted to cover this story and we wanted to do it in the right way. We had the resources that we had but we threw everything at it people who were usually on air and not on the air our production director happened to be picking somebody up at national airport a guy named blake rogers and he so he called in from national airport and gave reports on how they were reacting to it and eventually they threw everyone off the property they didn't know what to do with them people were walking up the george washington parkway Parkway. dragging their luggage behind them because they were they were evacuated from from a national airport there wasn't anywhere for them to go they shut the airport they, down they, they, they shut down i think you talked about that john you know they they stopped every incoming aircraft over the atlantic had to land in newfoundland yep. they crowded every airport in north northern part of this hemisphere yep. they had to land the airplane everything had to land and it was the first time and the only time it was the the first time that uh, all aircraft had been ordered to land I've in the country. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, Norman Mineto was the Secretary of Transportation at the time, and it's not even, I, I don't know if they ever figured it out, but the, he didn't even know if he had the authority to <laughs> shut down traffic, but he shut down traffic, and um, they ordered every plane in the country to land. Um, it was, I had a reporter downtown, our, our managing editor actually, Scott Wyckoff, I sent him downtown uh, on the metro and he he stood on k street and just talked about because metro was jammed and i think it might have been metro might have been shut down because they were afraid of terror uh problems and um people were just walking you know they were walking up k street get and away from it john wa- walking uh, uptown to to get away from it and we were an abc affiliate at the time and we uh, sent Scott into the ABC News Bureau, and he just reported for us from there. Uh, we Sale had, Street, on to Sale Street. Right. We had report. We had, I had a reporter who lived out in Fairfax County. There was no way for him to be able to get into the office, so he went over to a Nova Fairfax hospital where people were lined up hours and hours and hours and hours long to donate blood because. Nobody knew so much. Nobody time. knew. They, they didn't, you know, the, 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 the tragedy in that situation was they didn't need the blood. And most, almost all of that, and not just here in Washington, but nationwide, almost all of that blood got, ended up getting tossed. But people do what they can do to help. And, and that's, it proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt, John. We're going to take another break here from our town. And we're talking with John Matthews about, to me, a day that will live in infamy. And I share his view the most memorable broadcast day of my life also. The biggest need uh, for those doctors to assist them uh, is blood. And right now at Fairfax and Nova Hospital is WMAL's Tom Blas. Tom, uh, what's the situation there? Exactly, Scott. People from across the area are indeed showing up to help out by the hundreds to indeed donate blood. Here at the Woodburn Donor Center, they will be open 24-7 indefinitely. This woman stood in line for four hours. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Are you retired or soon will be? Is your will up to date? Don't want to leave a mess for your family to clean up. I'm attorney Mike Collins, the guy who sends you those invitations to my estate planning seminar. I'll teach you how to save taxes, avoid probate, protect your heirs from lawsuits, bankruptcy, even the divorce court. Keep your money and your family with our innovative Reservoir Trust. Watch the mail for your invitation. Tuition's free when you register online at MikeCollins.com. That's MikeCollins.com. Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. Scott Wyckoff is in downtown Washington. He reports now on WMAL in Washington. I'm Chris Corr. Good morning, everybody. Scott, what have you got for us? Chris, it's a... Basically shut down. I'm in the uh, at the ABC Bureau downtown. Every cell phone tower in the city is occupied now. Every payphone downtown has a line at least 10 people deep. Uh, right now, uh, 
every building I've been by anywhere downtown has shut down. People are scrambling to find a way home, completely gridlocked down here. Uh, cars just not moving along M Street, K Street, and even worse as you get closer to the White House. Uh, this is Andy Arker's house, and this is our town, and we're talking with uh, John Matthews, the former and continuing news director of WMAL Radio, about that most important day in both of our lives. And Andy, you know, we've talked so much already about uh, uh, what what happened that day, and what what and really what we haven't talked about is how it changed Washington and how efforts were made to improve security and things in Washington. And maybe we should even talk a little bit about how things haven't changed because this is a town that's lifeblood is bureaucracy. And <laughs> it's it's the lifeblood of this town. And so there's nothing that uh, this town likes more than forming a task force to go and write a, you know, a 500 page paper about how we can change things, which then can get conveniently shoved into somebody's drawer never to Buried. be seen again. John, you're Bur so right. It happens all the time in our town. It, it does. And, you know, after 9-11, we, we looked at things that we could improve. And that included communications because, um, and it, it, it for, both from a commercial point of view and just from a, a, a practical point of view, from a commercial point of view, all of the radio stations in town that didn't have the Associated Press or didn't have any means of news all of a sudden started making deals so that the next time they wouldn't have to borrow some TV station signal or WMAL signal right. uh, in case of an emergency. Uh, so a lot of resources went that way. A lot of resources went into improving cell phone coverage in the area because everybody needed it and wanted it. And it if didn't work. It didn't. It didn't work well enough on that day, and uh, a lot of resources were put in after that. Um, a lot of effort was put into evacuation plans because one thing that we did learn on on 9-11 was that uh, if people needed to get the heck out of town, there was no way for them to get the heck out of town. It's 15 years later. I know that plans have been drawn up, but, you know... You still it, can't do it, Jay. It, you can't move that many people. It's top of mind. It's top of mind for a while, and then it fades. Remember after 9-11, and this radio station gave them away as well, everybody had American flags everywhere. You could see them fl hanging from every overpass and every bridge. You could see one on, on everybody's car window. Everybody's um, lapel or every, their jacket every, or their shirt. Everybody had them, and, and you know, eventually these things, these things fade away. And you know, we since since 2001, we've seen the advent of the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration. You see every day reports of how people, how they don't capture knives going through the X-ray or guns going through the X-ray. Um, you often get the feeling that the TSA exists so that people will not be scared to fly, not because they actually stop John, anything it's, it's, it's such a that you're absolutely right it's a band-aid and it's a public band-aid it's in front of everybody it's not going to stop what happened that day you got to stop them before they get on that airplane well that's funny as we speak on the day that this is recorded the secretary of transportation and the director of homeland security had a news conference at reagan national airport today and in which the topic was how we're going to make lines move faster at the tsa at, at the airport and really, because they've become such an inconvenience, they're now concerned more about how do we do this quicker than really about <laughs> how, do we, how do we make it more secure. John, you know, because I, I always believed from the beginning it was a job fair and that whole bureaucracy is set up to get people some jobs, which is a great thing. But I don't think that they if, John, you know, what shocks me is people get stopped trying to get through with a gun. Why can anybody be that unaware of the world to try to get a gun through security? They do. I, I did a story on this just in the past week or so. They had, I believe it was at Dulles Airport, they had they they uh, uh, got 45 guns in the month of August, which was l less. It was the, the news was that it was less than normal. 45 guns were stopped at, at the TSA lines and during the month of August. 
and and you're not allowed under any circumstance to walk on board with a gun. Doesn't no, matter how right. you can you can with uh, proper permission you can check one in on an airplane to go through check baggage, but you can't carry one on a plane. But it doesn't stop people from trying. And if you've ever been there, you know, even if it's a pen knife that's uh, you know three inches long or two inches long, how about an, I got they took my nail clippers one time. Yeah, they John. they still take nail clippers. You can go and you can see the big plastic bins full of nail clippers and pen it knives. Doesn't make sense if but, anything. But you're they're safe from you know you can always get them with your nails you can't cut your nails so you can scratch them that way andy how's that john we've seen so much and you've been a big part of it now uh what do you think about our town and and what we're doing with the congress how have they reacted to um uh, I, I don't know whether they got a shelter up there or not but they dug a big hole and Maybe they're going to bury themselves. I, you know, you hear that the, they've done things to places like the Greenbrier or or uh, or other right. places. You know, give them places where to go. We still don't know for sure where uh, Dick Cheney's undisclosed location was back on nine eleven. <laughs> um, you know, Congress. It's it's the lifeblood of our town. It's uh, you know, it, it's what puts money in all of our pockets. But. You know, that's that's a whole other, you know, you can have me back right. for another podcast sometime to talk we'll about Congress because they have not uh, they, they're not getting anything done. Well, we, our, one of my heroes, Winston Churchill, you're also one of my heroes. Churchill said it's the worst form of government possible except for all others. That's right. And, and he could have been right. But, John, this has been just delightful. You are certainly a big part of our life and a big part what you've done for for WMAL. And we like to brag on it, John, because it does exist in our minds. And what Janice did in her years at WMAL, she was on deck for so many things. I remember the uh, the Air Florida crash, and uh, Janice hopped into that newsroom, and they called me in there. And I tried. I called the Marine Detachment at the Bowling Field or what Naval Air Station over there. And the guy said to me, he said, that's commercial. We can't get involved in it. I said, there's an airplane in the water. My, Too bad. My first exposure, and I know that we're wrapping this up, but my first exposure to WMAL was the Air Florida crash. And the news director at the time, Len Dybert, played for, I was an intern here. Um, and the the uh, news director at the time, Len Dybert, played for the interns a tape of Captain Dan standing on the shore of the Potomac River describing what was happening there and that was my first real exposure to news and i'll never forget it to this day and so he, the, the you know it all gets a big circle of life it all gets passed on another wmal first of wmal exclusive because captain dan was there yep. and it just so happened that he knew what to do but john this has been delightful and and uh, we will have you back john about another subject but we don't want to get into that now but we look forward to it. And this has been John Matthews. It's been a wonderful discussion about WMAL and our past. Thank you for all you do for WMAL. Thank you very much. This is Andy Arkershaus, and this has been Our Town. You've been listening to Our Town Season 1 with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town podcast episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. We welcome your comments and suggestions on how you like the show or who you'd like to hear from next. Catch us on Facebook at Our Town DC or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcasts.